Good afternoon from Las Vegas. Good morning to those of you on that side of the world. I see we've got some from Australia, from Asia. We've got a bunch from the Jamaica, Guyana region. That's fantastic. Great to have you here. Yes, happy Australia Day for those in Australia. Uh, great to have you here with us. For those across the U.S., uh, Egypt and Turkey. Oh, my goodness, Maura. It's a late, late night or very early morning for you, one or the other. It's great to see uh, thanks. If you haven't typed in where you're at, I'd love to see uh, England. Dang, Philip, you've uh, oh, not stayed up too late, but definitely fairly late. That's for sure. Canada in the building as well. So today, what are we looking at? We're looking at management versus leadership. Is it management versus leadership or is it management and leadership? We'll work that out during our conversation today. You know, leadership is something that uh, became a very powerful part of the business world and really in the 90s, I guess, it became a massive part of what was being taught. And somewhere in the 90s, uh, after, I guess, the uh, uh, books, the One Minute Manager series all became uh, bestsellers, somewhere there we said, no, you don't want to be a manager, you want to be a leader. And I think management became a dirty word. And we'll look today as to why that's uh, not really what uh, we're aiming to achieve uh, in our business. So, what I'd like you to do is to type in for me what it is you want to get out of this webinar. So what is it you're here for? What is the main reason you are here? What are you aiming to achieve? What are you aiming to learn uh, by being here today? What is it you want to get? Is it you want to get better at management? Is it that you want to get uh, your team performing better? Is it you want to double your profits by working through your people? If you build good people, they build a good business. My goal of being here with you today is to introduce you to what we do at Action Coach to help you understand how business coaching can help you, to show you what I do as a book, as an author of books, a teacher of courses, and to help you get coaching, whether the coaching is a book or whether the coaching is just the webinar we do today, or whether it is working with one of my Action Coach teams somewhere in the world to achieve your dreams, goals, and make them a reality. Excellent. Good to see people starting to type them in. I've got a few coming in. Balance the two hats. Help owners identify the behaviors of each. Okay. Having a panel talk in front of 2,000 people soon. Be about leadership soon. And I'm here to learn. Great to see you, Rami. Great to have you with us. Improve my management skills to get best out of. All right. Well, to do all of these things, keep typing them in because the more you're clear on what it is you're here to get, the faster you will get it. World works that way. When we ask for what we want, then we have a chance of getting it. Until we ask for what we want, we'll just get what the other people want to give us. So let's be clear on that. I'm Brad Sugars. For those of you I haven't met, uh, I've been building Action Coach now for almost 30 years. This August will be our 30th birthday. I have a majority owner or major owner of many other companies, everything from commercial cleaning to uh, uh, business coaching, life coaching, to uh, the other end of the scale, restaurants, catering companies, you name it, we've got some level of involvement in it. So uh, that's a little bit, I started as an accountant, by the way, uh, I know most people go, oh, really, that's great. And no one's really ever excited by that, but we will get to our lessons of today and how we grow. My hope by the end of today is that I get all of you to commit to some further learning that the yearn to learn is one of the greatest things. The more you learn, the more you will earn. So be that a book, be it something else. Now question, born or made? What do you think? Type in your answer for me. Born or made? What happens? How does someone become a leader? Are they born with leadership tendencies and they get made into it? Are they fully made into it? Are they born that way? No matter what, it doesn't matter what. They were going to be a leader from day one. Like, you know, I see myself in a leadership role out there in the business world. And was I born this way or what was it? What are people thinking? I'm getting both. So I'm getting maids, borns, maids, both. Oh, I'm getting all sorts of different answers. All right. Let's think of it this way. Okay. Let's keep it. Oh, we've got oh, good. We're getting a few different answers. Born with traits and then learn the leaders through actions. So let's first of all define what is a great leader in business thing. They attract great employees. My dad taught me many years ago that if you want to have great people work for you, you got to be a great leader. Great people do not want to work for average leaders. Great people don't want to work in average companies. Great people want to join great companies that are achieving great things. So make certain that that is why it is. Not only do they attract great people, they build great people. 
You know, I've said it over and over, and I think I even said it earlier here today on the webinar. If you build your people, they build your business. If you don't build your people, they can't build your business. Build great people, they build great companies. No more complex than that, I think, is, is probably the simplest way to put it. To build them, you got to keep them. So great leaders retain people. So we're thinking about what it is we want to do. We want to find them, attract them, build them, and keep them. Okay, same as with customers, I guess. You want to find them, get them to make a purchase and keep them. Well, with great team members, we want to do the same. And in this day and age, it takes both management and leadership to do that. Now, if we go through and start thinking about management and leadership and we add this third term, coaching, is coaching part of management and leadership? How does coaching fit into management and leadership? And that's something we're going to get to more and more today. Now, what is coaching? If I can give you the simplest definition of coaching, coaching is using questions, okay? Coaching is using questions to achieve a desired outcome. No more complex than that. If we think about it, what we do as coaches is we ask great questions that people have never thought of before. And by asking you the question, you will then start to think about the answer and then all of a sudden you'll come up with the answer. I challenge my clients all the time. I challenge my team all the time. When they come to me with a goal, I said, how did you pick that goal? Why did you not pick double that number? What would happen if you picked double that number? Challenging people is a big part of coaching. So management versus leadership, leadership versus management, or management and leadership. I think it's got to be an and, okay? To be a great CEO, to be a great leader, to be a great manager, to lead a business, to run a business, to grow a business, to lead or build a team, we need both management and leadership. Now, doesn't have to be in the exact same person. I look at my company, I'm the CEO and my chief of staff. I'm leadership, she's management. She runs the company on a day-to-day -day basis. I'm still the leader of the company, but she is the person who runs the company on a day-to-day -day basis. So keep that in mind. Management and leadership are both needed. But now let's take a look at it. If you've been around Action Coach for a while, uh, you've seen this before. If you're brand new to us, let me explain it to you. This is above and below the point. Below the point, there are three behaviors you will see out there in the world. Blame, excuses, and denial. Say them in your head for me. Blame, excuses, and denial, okay? Now, that is your bed, and you lay in it, okay? Blame is where someone on your team always finds someone to point the finger at, okay? Excuses is where there's always a reason to do it. I see I've got a couple of people here from the UK. I know you guys don't use the word excuses. You use the word reasons. It's because you're fancier than us Australians. Well, I'm an American these days, I guess, so I have to take both. Um, denial. Denial is where someone thinks they're great, but they're not. You know, those sorts of things. Now, if you are getting those behaviors, blame, excuses, or denials, it's because of either bad management or a lack of management. And we're going to deal with that here today. Bad management or a lack of management allows those behaviors or creates those behaviors in an organization or in a team. Above the point... Uh, responsible, accountable, and ownership. That's where leadership kicks in, okay? So management gets them above the point. Leadership takes them right through to where they have ownership in their head and their heart. By the way, if you do have any questions, feel free to type them in at any point in time. I will have time at the end for questions, but if you do have some along the way, type them in. Hopefully I can answer them along the way or at least at the very end. So, when we first of all start looking at an organization and we start with a team owner or a C-level exec and we ask them, okay, rate your people. Don't rate them on above and below the point. Rate your people on blame, excuse, denial, ownership, accountability, responsibility. Where are they? Put them on a chart. So you'll see business owners sit down and go, yep, I got Bob at denial. I got Mary at denial. I've got this person at excuses, this person at blame, this person at responsibility, this person at accountable, this person at ownership. And so you start to get an idea as to what do you got to do with your team? Because you don't coach a team, you coach individuals. You don't manage a team, you don't lead a team, you manage and lead individuals. So each individual needs different level of growth and a different way of looking at things, okay? By the way, one thing I do ask when you're on my webinars, 
if you do get a great lesson, if you get something, you go, wow, that's a blinding flash of the obvious. Wow, that's amazing. Or wow, I used to do that and I don't do that anymore. If you remember something great, type it into the chat window so that people can actually start to see other lessons going on. That way we all draw on each other's lessons and we make it. So type any of your, type your, so far, what's your lesson so far? Type it into the chat window so we can get um, uh, people to get going and do that. Uh, please mention the biggest mistakes leaders and managers make. We will be getting to those, definitely. Thanks, Paul. So creating and managing denial. What is denial? Well, creating denial is, is kind of like allowing it. If you have a person who thinks they're a rock star, this is the person that comes into meetings, they're quiet the whole meeting, they walk outside and they start sabotaging everything. This is the person that behind the scenes tries to backstab things. This is the person who thinks they're an amazing performer and they may have been at some point in time, but the world's moved on. They haven't, they're no longer a rock star performer, but they still think they are. They're in denial about their position in the company. This is the person that when you actually do finally fire them, everyone on the team says, oh, about time you got rid of that guy. And you're like, what do you mean? Well, they were doing this and this and this and this. And you're like, well, why didn't you tell me? And they say, well, because we thought you knew. And at some level, you did know, right? Deep in your heart, deep in your mind, you knew it. You just didn't want to confront it because, you know, better the devil you know. No, 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 no. If you allow that behavior to go on in your organization, what are you saying to the good people in your organization? You don't have to work either. You know, well, yeah, yeah, I get it. You're doing a great job, but... We're just going to let that person sit over there doing an awful job, stinking up the place, being the bad apple, being the cancer, all of that sort of stuff. No, no, no. Can't do it. You, you just have to confront that behavior. Now, get your ducks in a row. Make sure you know what you're going to talk about when you confront them. But if someone is at that level of denial and you don't confront them, then you're allowing that behavior to go on. Think of it this way. Uh, there's 10 people on your boat. 10 of them are rowing in that direction and two of them are rowing backwards. Okay, that means there's only actually six rowing forwards because two of them are rowing forwards just to make up for the two rowing backwards. We've got to make certain that we build in management systems that don't allow denial to creep in. We do not want that behavior in your organization, okay? So, Let's let's break this down, okay? We need to remove this person or we need to confront this person, okay? Now, confronting them often is a way of removing it. When I say you want to confront it, I mean exactly that, okay? You will sit this person down and you will have your ducks in a row. You'll have the numbers or whatever information you need to back up your statements, but you would want to sit them down and say, hey, listen, I know you think you're one of the best employees in the company. And I know that you think that if it wasn't for you, the company wouldn't be where it is. And that if you left, we would all die. Uh, and now, by the way, have they said this stuff behind your back? Probably. Okay. Find it all out though. Find out what's going on and then confront. Don't confront without information. Okay. Here's my reality. If I was to list the worst employees in the company, you're on the list. Now, I don't believe you should stay there on that list. I believe you can be at the top employees in the company. You used to be at the top employees of the company. I want to put a plan in place for you to get back there. Now, this is not an up for debate where they go, oh, I don't think I'm that bad. No, no, we're not debating here. This is my opinion. This is where it's at. This is the new plan. Over the next 90 days, we're going to do, and you list out what they got to do. Now, the, the bottom thing of that plan always has to be, you're going to report to me every morning and you're going to report to me every afternoon and we're going to see what happens and you're going to tell me in the morning what you're going to do and you're going to share with me in the evening what you got done. Somewhere in this conversation, about 80% of the time, these people say to me, there's no way I'm doing that. Okay, then I'll have to accept your resignation. Give them a piece of paper and a pen and walk out of the room. Allow them to resign. Okay, do not try and talk to me. Oh, I don't want you to go. No, no, don't back down. Don't go into that wimpy sort of a thing. Thanks, by the way, for those typing in their stuff. Denial, I like that for. Don't even notice I am lying. <laughs> That's a great one. Thank you for it. Thank you, team Tampa. Don't even notice I am lying. Love that one. So we got to remove them, confront them, deal with it. Now, if they follow the 90-day plan 
and they report to you every morning and every evening, generally they'll be back on track. I've found in my experience about 20% of the time we can salvage someone who's in denial. Now, here's a question for you. How did they get to denial? What did you do that allowed them to get to be that bad of an employee? Obviously, on day one, when you hired them, they weren't that bad of an employee, right? So how we manage and how we lead or our lack of management and lack of leadership has created this problem. We have to take ownership that we have created or allowed this problem to become a reality. We now need to deal with that, meaning you, okay? Not, not me. I don't have to come there and help you with it. You got to deal with it. If you've allowed it, you created it, you got to deal with that thing. All right. So let's go to the next level, blame. All right. How does blame happen in an organization? Well, first of all, if you allow it, if you do it, if you're blaming others, then of course your team picks up, hey, it's okay to blame people here. Oh, I'm blaming a supplier. No, oh, no, I'm blaming the economy. No, no, I'm blaming the, the politicians. If you're blaming others, then of course people pick it up that we have a culture of blame. I can do that too, okay? If you're allowing people to blame, oh, they're blaming a customer. I, I hate that in companies when people blame customers. Like, really? You're blaming the person who's giving us money for your mistake. That doesn't make any sense to me, okay? But let's go on further. What's the fastest way to get blame happening in an organization? Well, I think of it, if I go home and, uh, and the kids are there and they got to set the dinner table and I ask a bad question. See, bad management questions lead to bad behaviors. What's a bad management question? A question that says, why isn't this done? Who should have done this? Okay, if I go to my kids and go, Hey, who's, who was supposed to have set the dinner table? What are they going to do? Like everyone's pointing at everybody else, right? No, when I'm asking these questions, I'm guaranteed to get blame, okay? I'm guaranteed to get it, okay? Now, if I want to get excuses, what am I going to do to get excuses? I'm going to ask what question? I'm going to ask, why isn't this done? How come this isn't sent to the customer yet? So the questions you ask determine that. So you've got to really watch your questions. If you're getting a lot of excuses from people, it's because you're asking questions that lead to excuses. If you're getting a lot of blame from people, you know, you go to your sales team. Why haven't we got the numbers? Well, marketing hasn't given us the leads. Okay, let me go and talk to marketing. If you follow the blame, does that make sense? If you follow the blame, so... What do we got to do to do great management and great questions, okay? Let me just go back one. Um, if we are looking for excuses or denial, sorry, if we're looking for blame or excuses by asking bad questions, by following it, by allowing it, by doing it ourselves, if I'm the one giving excuses, then of course my team is going to make up excuses to, to do it. You know, and it's funny how... We don't accept excuses from people who are doing a job we used to do. Like if you were an engineer and the people who are doing engineering do something, you go, no, no, it doesn't take that long. I used to do that. I know exactly how long it takes. Don't give me that excuse. But in other areas of the company, you're like, well, I really don't know what they should be doing. So I guess I have to accept that excuse because I've got no idea what's going on. Learn more so you don't have to accept excuses. Uh, a great manager or leader that I learned from many, many years ago, he said, my job as the manager or as the leader of the company is the consistent and never ending removal of excuses. Anytime someone had an excuse for something, great, let me remove that excuse. You know, if I can remove it, then it happens. So what sort of questions should we ask? First and foremost, we ask forward moving questions. A great question in management has three parts to it. Number one, it's forward moving. What does that mean? Instead of why isn't this out to the customer, what do we need to do to get this to the customer? Okay, a different focus. Don't focus backwards, focus forwards, okay, with your question. Second thing is it should have a time orientation. So instead of why isn't this out to the customer, what do we need to do to get this to the customer in the next 10 minutes? Okay, so I've now added a time orientation. Third part to it, you want to add a detail orientation, okay? What are the first two things you need to do to get this to the customer in the next 10 minutes? Make them think. See, I want to remind you of these uh, two words. In fact, write these two words down, okay? Number one word, okay? And this is management. Management is about competency 
and productivity. Write those two words down, competency and productivity. If you haven't studied my 30X business yet, I would highly suggest you do that. Get with your action coach and ask them to study 30X business, or I'll give you a link at the end of this session. Actually, uh, team, can we put the link up for people, put it in the chat window for people if they want my 30X business, and uh, you guys can get the New Year's special or talk to your coach about it either way. If I'm going to build competency and productivity, Okay, that's my job as a manager, build competency and productivity. I need to make people think. If I want them to be more competent, I got to make them think. So let's, you know, when I look at the dumbest mistakes I see in management, number one dumbest mistake in management, my door is always open. Dumb mistake. Why? Well, let me explain it to you. When they come to you, they ask you a question, and what's the thing that most managers do? Now, let me explain to you why they do this first. Most managers suffer from superheroitis. What does superheroitis mean? They wear their cape and they wear their underpants on the outside. What does that look like in a day-to-day -day world? Your team come to you with a question, you give them the answer. You go, hey, I knew the answer, look at that. Um, big example of this, uh, one of our clients in the south of the UK, Young gentleman had a manufacturing business. His office, uh, his manufacturing floor, uh, the warehouse was one of those where the office was hanging up on the wall like it was a mezzanine level. And he could look out of his window and see the entire production run happening out there where the trucks would come in and get filled. He could see the whole thing from his window. Now, whenever anything went wrong on the production line, a red light would flash. Now, as soon as he saw the red light, what do you think he did? Do you think he sat there and said, oh, that's great. The team will fix that. They know exactly what they're doing. I've trained them so well. They're going to get that job done. They'll get the production line back on immediately. Fantastic. I'm great. I've built such a great team. No, of course he didn't. He suffered from superheroitis. What did he do? He jumped up. He ran down the stairs. In fact, he took great pride in telling me how he could slide down the banister rail and get down there even faster. He would run to the spot where this thing needed fixing. And of course, he, he was bragging about how fit he was that he could run. He could sprint there, even though it's down the other end of the, the warehouse. Long story short, what was he teaching people by diving in himself and fixing everything? Okay. Some of you said nothing, right? No, no, he wasn't teaching them nothing. What was he teaching them? Uh, you don't matter enough for me to train you how to fix this. You're not smart enough to fix this. I'm the only one smart enough to fix this. You know what? If you make a mistake, you get a 10 minute break because all you got to do is stand there and watch. And while I fix everything, because the whole production line stopped because one thing's gone wrong. You know, think about superheroitis and how bad it can be and, and what it does and how it suffers. Oh, there's the link to the 30X. All right. On a scale of one to 10, how well do you suffer from superheroitis? On a scale of one to 10, how much do you suffer from superheroitis? Type it in for me. Don't just write it on your own notepad. Type it in, make it public. Admit to it. Go on. There you go. Come on, Natalie. What's your score? There we go, Ford. What's your score? Oh, look at that. We're getting five, six, and seven. We get some, hey, we're getting some honest answers, some nines. Yes, I love it. So we got to move off of superheroitis. We got to start them thinking. See, my door is always open. If they come to you with a question, how do you answer their question? You answer their question with a question. Why? You want them to think. Boss, should we go left or right? Well, okay, what are the benefits of left? What's the negatives of left? What's the benefits of right? What's the negatives of right? Fantastic, fantastic. Keep chatting with them. Ask them five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten questions until they're leaning in the right direction. And then say, so what do you think the decision should be? Well, I think we should go left. Excellent. That's what I would have chosen too. Good job. Thanks. Go do it. Now, they might ask me that same question one more time, but once they've done it two or three times, I'm building competency, making them think. If I do all the thinking, who do they have to keep coming to all the time to get the thinking done? Me. Okay, don't do the, oh, I don't want to be, I don't want to be the, the bottleneck in my organization, especially from a thought, uh, from a thinking process. Um, yeah, so keep doing that. Keep building it and building your people. Competency and productivity. If you look at management, and we'll get to a few of the things to solve that in just a little while. Management in the moment. Let's have a discussion around that one. How many of you ever worked for someone whose management style was to run out onto the football field and yell at you in the middle of the game? Like you did something, you made a mistake, and instead of 
them leaving it go and helping you fix the problem. They came out to give you the lecture. How many of you have ever had the lecture manager? Oh my God, the lecture. Um, yes, the lecture is an interesting uh, management style. What do you think they're thinking when you're lecturing them about how they got it wrong? They're actually thinking, I hate working here. I don't want to work for you. Because remember the old saying, people don't leave companies, they leave managers. Okay, so we've got to make certain that, that we're being that manager. Now, management in the moment is talking about how do we get to our brain to a point where we ask that forward moving question, where we don't dive into the problem right there and then. We get, we get it fixed. And we bring the problem up later in our meeting. And I'll talk more about those meetings in just a little while. Okay. Make sure that in the moment, what we do is we have the forward moving question. We get a solution. We get the solution moving forward. And then we bring the problem up later. Because when there's high emotion, there is low logic. And if we're in high emotion, see, when your team member made a mistake, they already know they made a mistake. Don't make them hide their mistakes by pushing down on them when they made the mistake. Yep. Made a mistake. All right, what do we got to do to fix this? How are we going to get this to the customer in the next 10 minutes? What's the first two steps? But move them forward, get them going. Later on, when you're out of emotion, then you can both deal with what actually happened in that scenario. So leading responsibility, okay? Let's talk about responsibility of managing it versus them taking responsibility for themselves. If we have good management systems, which I'm gonna go into good management systems in a little while for you. If we have good management systems in play, then we are in a position called, hey presto, what we're doing right now is making sure that they take 80% of the responsibility for their own. They only need about 20% management. See, people often argue with me on one point, and that is that, you know, they, they use this term micromanagement. They say, you don't want to be a micromanager. Listen, think of management like raising a kid. Until they have competency and productivity, you need to micromanage them. You bring on a brand new employee. Do they need micromanagement in the beginning? Many times, yes. Why? They've never done the job before. If they've never done the job before, do they need someone to hold their hand? Yes, it doesn't actually have to just be you, but it has to be someone. Someone has to show them around. Someone has to get them up to speed. Someone has to help them build competency and productivity. Sometimes you need to micromanage people, otherwise they will die. You know, when the baby's born, you got to micromanage that thing. If it doesn't eat, it's going to die. So you need to micromanage some people just until you build their competency and build their thing. Now, I don't want to micromanage them for long. If I got to micromanage them and they've been here five years, then either my management is really bad and I'm not building any competency in that person or they're the wrong person, okay? So you need to micromanage and build competency and build productivity so that they get to that level of responsibility and they take it themselves versus you have to manage it in them. About 80% of that should be the management system. About 20% of that should be you as the manager actually helping them uh, sustain that. People do need someone to report to. If they've got no one to report to, they will not perform at the level they could perform at. If they are not measured on a daily and weekly basis, they will not perform at the level they could perform at if they were measured on a daily, weekly basis. Think of it this way. I enjoy working out. I enjoy it. I do it myself, okay? Now, when I go to a class and do a workout or when my trainer comes to my house and does a workout, I work out much harder when they are there managing me, pushing me, cajoling me, getting me to do more than if I just did it myself, okay? So always think of it that way. Um, once they have taken responsibility on themselves, once they're thinking for themselves, once they're doing it themselves, then they're promotable. Until they are at full level of responsibility and taking self-responsibility, not promotable. Don't over-promote people. It's the fastest killer of people in your organization there can be. Make sure you promote them when they're ready, not just because you need that sort of thing, okay? Great points there, Dave. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Engage, enlighten, educate, and empower. If you have never seen my company, Engage and Grow, please look at that, engageandgrow.com. All right, let's keep moving forward. By the way, yes, if you have questions, that is the thing. Um, I just want to go back on one point there. Uh, and it's something you put up there, Belinda, that, that made me think of this. 
it does take more time when you're first working with someone for them to get to be better at what they're doing. It does take more time. It's kind of like um, one of my kids is at the phase called tying their own shoes right now. Okay. We're late to leave the house. This is yesterday. We're late to leave the house. She's like, dad, I'm tying my shoes. Let me just do it for you. No, dad, I'm tying my shoes. 15 minutes later, we finally get the shoes tied and we're finally leaving the house. Like, oh my God, we're already late. Anyway, the point of it is stop tying your people's shoes for them. Allow them to tie their shoes a few times so that they learn to tie their shoes so that later on they can be adults too. They get annoyed by their kids learning to tie their shoes. Okay. But if you're tying your shoes for your employees, if you're playing superhero, stop doing it, move on, get going. All right. Leading accountability. Accountability. See the word in the middle? Count. Okay. So there needs to be numbers. If you are not measuring, you can't hold people accountable. Okay. Now accountability usually happens when someone is accountable for an end result. They're accountable for a team. They're accountable for people or they're accountable for numbers. Okay. They're accountable for a result or accountable for people. Like I hold you to account for that team to perform. I hold you to account for the company to hit that numbers. Okay. Again, about 20% of your people will raise to this level of accountability where they'll get to, you know, wanting to be leaders of the organization, wanting to be in that place. They've got to take accountability. They can't be given accountability. Again, people have to get to a promotable position in their mind, not promotable with skills, but promotable as the person they are. When someone is to be held to account, do not wimp out on them. Do not make it easy on them. Do not go, oh, well, you know, I know you had to get it done, but if you didn't, that's okay. No, no, no one can perform unless there is pressure. Pressure builds performance. Pressure, performance. Without pressure, no performance. Why do sporting teams perform better? Because they got to play against other teams. When they play against someone bad, I know when I go and play golf and I'm playing with a few of my buddies that don't play golf that much and they're awful, my golf game struggles. I'm not good on those days. Now, when I go and play a game of golf with some of my buddies that are scratch golfers, I'm a much better golfer on those days. People perform to what's around them. So hold people to performance. Hold them to account. Don't yourself wimp out on accountability. Don't you give up ownership and let down the people who have taken accountability in your organization. So these are the people you work with and work through. All right, let's take that to the next phase. Ownership. Too many times I see in especially small to mid-sized companies where they think ownership is about giving people a shareholding. No, no. Ownership is what's in their heart, not what's in their wallet. If, if, you, if they take ownership in their head and their heart, that's where it needs to be. Now, to take ownership, there's got to be something more than just money. There needs to be a common goal. There needs to be a mission that people are moving towards, okay? You know, that's what you've got to be looking for. And this is where you reward people for their ownership. You reward for that loyalty and you say, you know, and, and I, I love it when people think, oh, I thought they owned the place. Yes, that's great. Like the people that run our restaurant, when someone comes in and they say, oh, I thought the maitre d' was the owner of the place. Excellent. I love that you think they're the owner of the place. That's a fantastic result. That's exactly what we want to achieve. If you didn't perceive that they own the place, then we did not do a good job of building that human being into running our organization for us. Okay. So back to that above and below the point. Okay. Think about what you're creating right now. Think about your people in your organization. Are you creating blame, excuse, denial? And don't, don't go into denial and say, oh, I'm not doing any of that. No, no, that's not the way we play this game. The way this game is played is we sit back and we go, okay, what am I actually creating? And you look around, you go, you know what? I got about, and, and you might be doing great. You might say, you know what? I got about 80% of people uh, above the point. Great. And I got about 10% of people at ownership. Excellent. What do you got to do to get the rest there? What's one or two things you can do? Let's go into that. Okay. Let's start looking at. All right. Let's go back to the qualities of a great leader and start uh, managing ourselves into this process. Because who you need to become. Remember, you set a goal and you grow into the goal. So keep growing, keep learning, keep growing into your goals. So when we take a look at all of these things here, you can almost, if you want to take a screenshot of this, you can almost say, you know what? What I actually need to do is rate myself on all of these things. Now, why do we bring this up? First of all, the first two points. If a manager's job is 
productivity and competency, right? That's their job to get build competency and build productivity in the organization. The leader's job is to build passion and responsibility, okay? Give them that focus, give them where they're needing to go. So I always think about it if, if I as a leader can do two things, if I can get passionate, focused people, then I've done my job. Passionate, focused people, then I've done my job as a leader. You know, that's really what we're, we're thinking about, okay? So all of these aspects of leadership are definitely things we need to do. Now, by the way, uh, if you have not already, uh, chat with your action coach about our management training program. And uh, in Q2 this year, the leadership training program, if you've got team members who you want management training for, they can put them through it. And if you've got team members you want leadership training for, they can put them through it. Or if you personally want management and leadership training, you can personally go through those programs. But chat with your action coach about those programs. Now, great management and great leadership. I want to spend the rest of our time today on that. What is great management? What does it look like? What is our management system? What is great leadership and how does that work? Okay. So firstly, great management. Um, we believe that a team member needs to create two lists. Number one list is their daily list. And we call that their frog list. The old how to eat that frog, Brian Tracy, What's the frog list, okay? That means what are the things you got to do tomorrow? So before people leave the office, they have to do that. Now, let me tell you where I first started this. I started this because I was one of those people that couldn't leave work at work. Anyone suffer from that disease? Wave at me. You know, I couldn't leave work at work. So what I ended up doing is I wrote myself a, a list every day at the end of the day of what I needed to do tomorrow, what I needed to do and what I needed to achieve the next day. So I set my goals, my two to-dos to and two achieves for the next day. And funnily enough, doing that not only allowed me to leave my work at work or increase my ability to leave my work at work, but it increased my productivity by at least 30%. And we found the same for every team member in every company around the world. Second list is the lion list. On a Friday, they make two lists. On a Friday, they, say, they sit down and they go through their lion. Lion stands for... Last week, issues, opportunities, and next week. So I build my lion list, okay? And that's, that shows down what I've got to do next week. So the, the final part of that on the lion list is next week. So on Monday morning, we have a weekly whip meeting, work in progress. The lion, the lion meeting is, is later in the week. This is the whip meeting. And what we do at that meeting is, let's say I've got eight direct reports. We go through any group discussions. What does the team need to make decisions on? So we don't make decisions in the dark. We make decisions as a team in the moment. And that way the team sees why we're making a decision. Isn't it important that people know why we're making a group decision that way? Fantastic. So we make group decisions. Then we go into everyone's weekly. We go around the table. We go through what everyone's doing for the week. And guess what? By going through what everyone's doing for the week, we find some gaps in communication. What is the purpose of a meeting? The purpose of a meeting is communication. Write that down somewhere. The purpose of a meeting is communication. So we communicate with each other. Who's doing what? And we find out by who's doing what. There's some things on some people's lists that need to impact others. And we have those gaps in communication cleaned up, closed up. And uh, even if the gap in communication is, hey, you two need to have a, a session together and get together on that and make sure that you know what's happening and make sure that it works, okay? Proactive meetings, okay? We don't do reactive management. We don't wait till there's a problem and then get in and solve it, right? We do proactive meetings. Now, what does this mean? I'm gonna grab my seat here for a second because this is an important point. I wanna drive this home. When you first start this meeting system, Monday mornings, doing the whip meeting. Thursdays, you're doing one-to-one -one meetings. What are you doing on Thursdays? One-to-one -one sessions with each of your team. Your Thursday meeting is called a lion meeting, okay? On your lion meeting, you go through last week, issues, opportunities next week, okay? So anything that went wrong is in issues. Anything in opportunities. Now, if someone's not bringing opportunities to the meeting, what does that tell you? You're not asking them for opportunities. Someone has to every single week. Every team member that reports into you every week should show up with an opportunity. 
Hey, here's a new opportunity. Hey, here's a new opportunity. If you've got 50, 100 people in your organization, all of a sudden, all of them are looking for opportunities to increase sales, decrease costs, grow the business, do something, then you're going to get a lot better response than if you're not asking for that every single week. So that's your Thursday meeting. Now, Monday is the team together. Thursday is one-on-one. -on -one. Why do we do it on Thursdays? Very simple. We don't wait till Friday because if we waited till Friday and we found out there was a problem, we don't have 24 hours to get it fixed. If we do it on a Thursday, we've got between now and the end of the week to get it fixed if they're off track. So what do I mean by proactive meetings? Well, when someone starts coming to me during the week, they send me an email and it's not urgent. What do you think my response to them is? Bring it to the meeting. Everyone write that down. Bring it to the meeting. This will be your favorite saying for the next two weeks or four weeks when you're putting this into practice. Bring it to the meeting. Why? Because we don't need to deal with stuff 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It's not urgent. We can make a decision on Monday or Thursday. It can wait a couple of days. Now, if it is urgent, how do we reply to urgent things? They ask a question. You answer their question with a question. Excellent answer. Thank you very much. You're all getting this. Fantastic. I love it. Keep making notes. Keep writing it down. Keep working. My 20-60-20 rule is a very simple one. If I give someone 10 days to get a job done. Now, by the way, lazy managers don't agree a time frame. Lazy management does not agree a time frame. Good management agrees a standard of performance and a time frame when they set a task. Okay. 20, 60, 20. If I say, let's, you've got 10 days to get this job done, two days into the task or 20% of the way into the task, I'm going to go and check. Hey, how are you doing with that? Carl, if it's you that's doing it, I'm going to come over and say, hey, Carl, how are you doing with that? We're two days in. What am I checking? I'm checking that you've started. <laughs> like, you know, it's, it's like, have they even started? If they have started, are they on track? If they haven't started, well, get started. We're 20% of the way in. 60% of the way in, I then check on the on it again. So a total of 80%, sorry. So 20 plus 60 is 80%. So eight days in, I'm going to go back and check on it again. Now, luckily enough, we have this amazing thing called Siri now on our phones. And you go on Siri and you say, hey, Siri, remind me in two days to check on uh, this and remind me in eight days to check on this. And boom, I go and check. You know, leads me to management by walking around. <laughs> My phone is on the other side of the room. Guess what Siri just did? Yes, that's right. She just answered for me. So I'm going to have to check on this and that in six or in two and eight days. So thanks, Siri. Um, walk, management by walking around. I'll give you an example. Uh, one of my clients was in the uh, construction business. And uh, I asked him, how are all your job sites doing? And he looked at me and said, I don't know. I don't go out to the job sites. I said, really? I want you to visit two job sites a week from now on. Amazingly enough, by getting up and going and visiting two job sites a week, he learned so many stupid things that were going on in his company that were wasting his money that by not going out and doing them, he would never have done. He also learned that his team thought of him as the, his, his dad had started the company, he took over and they thought, oh yeah, yeah, he's up there in his ivory tower driving his fancy cars. He wouldn't get his hands dirty, not like his old man. His old man was on the tools with us. The team didn't think good things of him as a leader by going on the job sites and showing up. And he literally would show up with a, 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 you know, a box of drinks and donuts type thing for all of the team to come down and have a donut and have a drink and tell him about what's going on in the job site. Made a big difference. Walk around. Daily KPI to achieve and the one minute manager. I love reading the one minute manager. It is definitely an important book. The daily, the daily list, meaning what do I have to achieve and what do I have to, to get done for tomorrow? All right. So, uh, great leadership. I think I already covered the first point off. Lead players, not a team. You don't lead a team. You lead different players and different players lead different leadership. That's why we use those profiles. The DISC profile, the VAK profile, their communication and behavioral profiles. It allows you to lead differently to different people, allows you to manage differently different people. So make sure you do that. Um, a leader that does not communicate very often is not a very good leader. More communication, better leadership. Very simple in that way. Leader stays focused on the big picture, on the future, on where we're going. 
A leader is also very good at listening when they ask questions. So don't just ask questions, ask and listen to them. Which, by the way, if any of you have uh, any questions, please type them in now. I'll get the team to tag them so that I can come back to your questions in just a little while. Um, the leadership set an example for the team, but steer from the back. Always had that simple statement in my mind that... Uh, when you're, I don't know if any of you are sailors or, or on, on boats at all, but the, the steering for a sailing boat is at the back. So the captain can see everything that's going on. I see too many leaders who lead from the front. They're like, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be the first one out of the trenches and run and do that stuff. No, I'm, I'm definitely a believer in the fact that if, if, if I wanna steer the ship properly, I gotta steer it from the back. I gotta be able to see everyone and what's going on in the organization to be able to do that, a good picture of that. So I mentioned questions, we're gonna to get to those. Uh, raise your hand, marketing book. This is my newest book. If you have not ordered a copy, please make sure you do it as soon as possible. The US version will be released in a few weeks. And so the UK version was sold out on its first print run. It's currently being reprinted and the Asia Pacific version will be, sold, will be launched, I believe in Q2. So if you want that team, can we put a link up for that for everybody? Thank you. My 30X challenge is the life challenge. If you have not done 30X life, I highly recommend doing it. Plan the rest of your life. Know where you're going, know what you're doing. Spend 30 days, 30 minutes a day with me on 30X life. 30x wealth. If you have not got a wealth plan for you and your family, chat to your action coach. Ask them about the 30x wealth challenge, or my team will put some links up for you to go direct. If you're not working with a coach, you can jump on our website, actioncoach.com, and get a uh, session with a coach for free. Just mention that you're on my webinar, and they will give you a session for free. And the 30x business challenge. If you have not studied my 30 days on business, I need you to make sure you do that or ultimately do the 90 day challenge. Do all three 30Xs, spend 90 days with me, half hour a day for 90 days, that will get it. Is it for free? Absolutely not, Maura. This testing today is free. The rest of it, you gotta start paying me for. You know, I always say, you don't pay me for my time, you pay me for my knowledge. I'm happy to do it. Often when I go and do speaking events, they say, you know, oh, look, we paid Brad to be here, yes. You didn't pay me to speak. You paid me to leave my house and leave my family. It's a very big difference between the two. So please jump on those. But more just for you, we will allow the New Year's special to all of you. The New Year's special gives you each of those programs for 99 silly little dollars. So 99 bucks each, go for your life, do that. Chat with a coach, do it. The 90 days, do that one. Or you can come join my university. I suggest you do the uh, 90 days first and then come do my university. All right, we're about to get to your questions. Uh -huh. All right, let's go. Uh, where are the submitted questions? Let me find them. The submitted question, here they are. Okay, some of you submitted questions before we went into the event. So let me deal with those first and then I get to that. Uh, A. Chen, I'm not sure if that's your full name, but uh, yes, the recording of this will go up on my YouTube channel, which by the way, if any of you have not uh, subscribed to my YouTube channel or my podcasts, please make sure you do that right away. Uh, in fact, uh, team, can we put up the link to my podcasts off of my website? If you haven't, actually, I just did two more podcasts recording today. It's called the Big Success Podcast. Uh, and there are the, the answers that I'm getting from these people, because I'm not asking them the usual questions they get asked. But these are great leaders who teach amazing stuff out there in the business world, in the wealth world, in the life success world. They're just giving me some stuff that I'm just sitting there, and it's like it's blowing my mind how good these people are teaching what we do about success. So please jump on that. But yeah, Gona, could we put that link up in the chat window? Uh, for those of you who have not hit the other links, please hit the other links. Even if you don't need them right now, at least you'll have the links uh, up on your screen so you can go to them later should you need them. Uh, there's the university link as well. Make sure you take a look at that. And there's the podcast link right now. 
Okay, the first two questions I've got. The rest, if you want to start typing in any questions you have about management leadership or any other subject you know I teach on the subject of, please do that uh, now. First question I got on management versus leadership is, Brad, why did management get such a bad name? You know, I don't know if I have the answer to that question, but what I did see is, well, actually, let me take you back a little ways. I think I was about, I don't know, maybe seven or eight, maybe six or seven. I remember my mom and dad sitting us down, all my, me and my two brothers, and saying that dad had to go away for 30 days. He was going away for a month, and it was a month-long training on management. Like when he got a promotion to a manager in his company, they sent him away to Macquarie University, or it was Macquarie Business School back then, for 30 days of management training before he got a promotion. Now, I, I look at most companies today, they promote someone to manager, what level of um, training do they get about how to be a manager? Mostly the training they get is, hey, uh, here's the keys, here's the alarm code, here's how you open up and close up, and there's your management training. They don't actually give them any management training. Again, chat with your action coach if you want to know about that. Um, management probably got a bad rap somewhere when there was a book called Maverick, uh what was his name and he talked about running a flat organization he had 150 people and no layers of management in his organization and i read the book thinking wow that's kind of cool but i'm never going to do that could you imagine have 150 people reporting to you Can you imagine how crazy that organization would be and how you know he's like well no you got to trust your people to get it done what even the brand new ones who don't know what they're doing no no so I've stayed on management ever since then. I think that that's a big thing. Uh, next question, Brad, how's management changed with this uh, generationally? Dang, that's a big question. Um, if we go back in time, and we look at the baby boomer generation. The baby boomer generation were a group of people that learned to think for themselves. They fixed things. So if they're if their lawnmower broke down, they went out and actually pulled it apart, learned how it was made, fixed the lawnmower, put it back together type thing. Um, my generation, I'm 51, so my generation, Gen X, we were the first generation to throw things out. Okay, we didn't fix things. My mom's generation, if you got a hole in your socks, you donned your socks. If you got a hole in your jeans, you patched your jeans type thing. Um, my generation, we were the first ones to think it was cool to have holes in your jeans type thing. You know, we didn't throw them out. We didn't replace them. There you go. I'm aging myself right there, aren't I? Levi's 501s. That was the jeans I used to. They were cool when I had them. Um, I think they're still cool today. I'm not sure. But anyway, um, what happened with the millennial generation and now when you look at Gen Z, They've not learned to fix things. They've not learned to think for themselves. They don't fix stuff. Even like in my own home, uh, my groundsman, Carlos, uh, I asked my uh, son, he's now nine. I think he was about seven at the time and, and something broke. And I said, oh, well, who do you think will fix that? Thinking he'll say, you, dad, of course you, dad. You know, dad's cool. He goes, oh, Carlos will fix it, dad. I was like, dang it. You know, it's like not even my kid thinks I can fix stuff anymore. But it's one of those things that management has become more about why, who you are, who the company is, and why you do what you do, your values, your mission, your vision, who you are, your culture document, your agreed core values. Those things uh, are what means more today. And so management today and leadership today has to be a lot more about why than it is just about what and how. So a lot more why in our discussions today. Why are we doing this? How are we getting there? All right, let me scroll through to some of these questions that have come up since today. Podcast link. Uh, if you didn't micromanage from the bigger than employee, then you are three months in with no results and performance. What do you do? Go back and apologize to them. Go back and say to them, hey, listen, obviously... Uh, you know, I haven't uh, been had the time to allocate to getting you at the high level of productivity and performance that you want to be. What I'd like to do is put a program in place over the next 90 days to do that. Let me know what you think should be in the program. I'll put my thoughts into some of the program when we meet next week. 
it never hurts to apologize to people. Apologize to your kids when you make a mistake. I remember learning that when I, I my oldest daughter, I always joke with her, a kid, she's 21 now. I go, I've never had a 21 year old kid. I don't know what I'm doing. You know, your brothers and sisters are lucky. They get you to, pra- I get to practice on you and then get it right with them sort of thing. And it's the same with a team member, apologizing to them. And I, I did this with Kobe a lot of times. Like, hey, like if I yell at my kids, like I, I apologize to them. Like, I, I really didn't mean to yell at you. I really shouldn't have yelled at you. But hey, you did annoy the heck out of me. You know, you know, just apologize to people when you get something wrong. Um, would we get another session like this, please? Yes, Maury, you can get hundreds more sessions like this. It's called 30, actually 90 sessions just like this. It's called 90X, 30X times three. Uh, Brad, it's Australia Day. How do you celebrate? Well, technically, yes, in Australia, it's Australia Day. Here, it's still the 25th, but my wife is making sausage rolls. She does love me. She knows I love sausage rolls, so we are getting sausage rolls for dinner this evening. A shrimp on the barbie, absolutely no chance. Um, Not one Australian ever cooked a shrimp on a barbecue. That was an American thing. We taught the Americans we did that. We've never done it in our lives. We call them prawns. We eat them, uh, we, we cook them but we eat them cold that's how australians do it um da, 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 da. question that came in how do you explain an abdicator leader versus delegator leader okay so delegation requires three things delegation requires a system training and accountability so if there's no measure there's no accountability okay you cannot manage what you do not measure is the old axiom sort of thing if you want higher performance you have to measure performance there's no other way to put it than that actually let me just stop sharing screen and go full screen here gang Uh, there we go you gallery now i can see all your pretty faces look at that i got everyone's face on here um so when you delegate you've got a system in place you've trained them and you've got uh, measurement happening in that case anything other than that is basically abdication you're just giving it to them and a lot of times you're giving it to them so you've got someone to blame um, if that makes sense. So, you know, yeah, let me give it to them. Yeah, let me give it to them. Um, mute all button. Where is it? There it is. The mute all button. Excellent. Um, one of your goals is to complete the Brad Sugars University in 2023. Don't make it a goal. Make it an action. To-do list item, Belinda. To-do list item. I love that. Fantastic. Um, micromanagement and training key differences i think they're the same thing i i use the term micromanagement until you get productivity and and uh competency if you lack competency or if a team member lacks competency it's because you haven't trained them coached them mentored them educated them send them off to other training courses i always find that's one of the easiest way a lot of the time i find it hard for me to train my people because i've forgotten more about what they're doing than they need to learn And I've also forgotten like the little steps. You know how once you've been doing something for 20 years, you forget the little steps. I find that a lot of people do that with uh, in in business in particular, they forget the little steps. And so it's kind of like, I like people who've been in the company maybe two years, three years to train more than me because they remember the little steps. You know, I, I, you forget, I forget a lot of them. I'm not sure if you do, yeah. Um, how do you get a manager to change the way they treat their employees? You send them to action coach. We train them for you and therefore you don't have to do it. Okay. It's, look, I even know it in my company. In fact, in fact, with my kids, like I'm one of the best teachers on wealth in the world. Do you think I can get my kids to do 30 X wealth for me? Not a chance. I'd have to, I'd literally have to pay them to do 30 X wealth. Like, you know, familiarity breeds contempt. Sometimes you are the worst person to train your people. Sometimes you're better off to bring in an outsider, an outside firm, a speaker or someone. Like, uh, I'll give you guys, and, and I know I've got a couple of my action coach team on this here with me today, but I mean, I let you in on a secret. I teach stuff to my coaches for years. I then bring in an outside speaker, you know, and it, it happened at our last uh, conference. And this particular speaker comes in and delivers the message. And it's the same thing. I've been teaching my coaches for years. And you know what? They come to me and say, Brad, wasn't that amazing? That was so incredible. When they said, and you sit there and you go, now, you know this, because it happens with your staff too. You teach it to them for a bunch of time. Brad Sugars comes along, writes a book on it. They come to you and go, wow, look at this. And you go, I've been teaching you that for years. They think, because I said it. It's, uh, 
How do you deal with a bossy manager? Uh, Alan, can you tell me, is that someone that's your boss or is that someone that works for you that's bossing their staff around? Can you just answer that question for me so I can answer the question? I'm watching 30X Business and it's incredibly informative, learning so much. I have lunch with Brad every day. <laughs> That's cool, Natalie. Thank you. I'm glad we're having lunch every day. That's fantastic. Actually, I'll tell you a worse one than that, Natalie. Someone wrote me a thing, said, you know, I go to bed sleeping with you every night. It's like, really? You listen to me? <laughs> no, don't, don't say that. That's funny. Um, but anyway, uh, yes, the books. Thanks, John, Jeff Feely. Thank you for the books. They are all out there. If you haven't got my books, jump on Amazon. They're all on there or go to bradsugars.com. You said pressure performance. What if people leave because of too much pressure? Ah, Natalie, there is two different types of pressure. One form of pressure is pull pressure and the other form of pressure is push pressure. So think of a balloon in my hands, right? Let's imagine I put a balloon in my hands. If I had a balloon here, I would do that. If, I, if I'm holding the top of the balloon, you know, the knot where you do it, and I'm stretching you, I'm setting new goals, I'm stretching you, then as I pull further, the balloon starts to go a thinner type thing because I'm pulling, pulling, pulling. Eventually, the bottom has to let go because the vision is so strong, it brings everyone up with me. If, however, I've got that balloon and I put the pressure on, you will do this or else. If you don't get it done, you will be fired. Morale will lift or everybody gets fired type. You know, if you're that negative manager, you're pushing the balloon down, eventually it explodes out. So the pressure, if you can think of simple examples, like, you know, the tree that's next to the, that's in the wind has a bigger root system. Think of the pressure on your team as being bigger goals, bigger drive, more things to achieve. Don't just think of the pressure of I'm yelling at you type thing. So great question. Great question. Thank you. How much longer have I got for questions? All right, we are done. Um, da, da, da. it's a colleague of yours, Alan. Um, send them this video when this goes up on my YouTube, Alan, send it to them. Okay. That uh, maybe let me do it. And then they'll go, holy shit, Alan, you really mentioned me on that call. Is that why you sent me this video? <laughs> anyway, uh, links, let's put the links back in. Um, let's make sure we're doing it all. All the 30 X's, if you haven't, get on my website, bradsugars.com, sign up for 30 X's, do all 90 days. Let's hang out together. Let's have lunch together for 90 days. None of this sleeping together thing for 90 days. Let's do lunch or breakfast together for the next 90 days, gang, and let's do it. Be well, take care. If you haven't working with an action coach, get on actioncoach.com and get a free session with one of my team. Be well, everybody. Thanks for being here with us today. Look forward to chatting to you again soon. Bye for now.